Hi, my name is Mary O'Brien. I'm the State Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator, and today I'm going to be talking about bicycle and pedestrian temporary traffic control. So I'm going to be going over some basic concepts and then the reason why we have them as the core concepts. The first one is ADA accessibility. So the American Disability Act and the ADA accessibility must be the same as the existing facility or greater. So why? Well, people with sight or mobility impairments often rely upon pedestrian and transit facilities for transportation, and their needs continue when the area is a work zone. Those with sight impairments will need a physical environment that is free of sharp edges, uneven grading, uh, obstructions that can cause tripping or falling hazards, such as this. <laughs> and those who are mobility challenged may use canes, crutches, walkers, wheelchairs, scooters, or no assistive devices at all. Their mobility challenges generally mean they have difficulty using steps, navigating narrow pathways, turnarounds, and changes in elevation. Even small changes are sometimes difficult for some mobility impaired pedestrians to negotiate, which is one reason that installing ramps is essential to maintaining access. The next general concept is to preserve safety features. For example, rectangular rapid flashing beacons or leading pedestrian intervals, sometimes known as LPIs. So a leading pedestrian interval means that a pedestrian will get the walk signal a couple of seconds before the cars running parallel will get the green light so that they get a head start at traffic lights. Other safety features are lighting at crosswalks, bulb outs, uh, refuge islands, and things like pedestrian hybrid beacons. They all increase pedestrian safety and should be preserved during construction to the greatest extent feasible. The next concept is to preserve connectivity of the facilities to and through the project. For example, that could mean something like keeping the sidewalk connected to the transit landing pad or keeping a bike lane connected to a trail. The next concept is to preserve directness of routes. For example, if we know many pedestrians are crossing from a school to an athletic field across the road, then when construction begins, find a detour that will get them back and forth as directly as possible while staying outside of the work zone area. The next concept is to provide like for like bicycle and pedestrian facilities. So for example, a permanent shared use path would have a temporary shared use path. And the reason for that is shared use paths and separated bike lanes attract a different type of person biking than an on-street bike lane or a paved shoulder does. So for example, a family might be comfortable biking to a local park on a shared use path, but not taking kids onto the road. That family may come through during construction and we wanna provide them the type of facility they are expecting and can stay safe on. Next, phase the construction work so the bicycle or pedestrian facilities are only closed when necessary. Detours and diversions are more dangerous and troublesome for pedestrians and people biking than for people driving. So it's desirable to reopen the regular sidewalks, bike lanes, shoulders, or shared use paths as soon as possible. One way to do this is by phasing work. So this picture just kind of shows what that might look like. Pedestrians and people biking are more vulnerable in the case of a crash or to street violence because they don't have the added protection of being inside a car or a truck. Additionally, pedestrians and people biking are exposed to the elements like hot or cold weather, rain, and lack of shade, and use their own energy to power themselves and push or carry anything such as goods or children. And they travel much more slowly than drivers, so a detour can add a considerable length of time to their trip. Going a block out of your way as a driver is inconvenient, of course, but it can be dangerous or troublesome for pedestrians and people biking. So we wanna limit it as much as possible. Next, separate pedestrians and bicyclists from vehicles, equipment, and operations. Pedestrians are the most vulnerable roadway users in a work zone, so we want to provide them with extra protection by separating them from cars, trucks, construction or maintenance equipment, and construction or work zone operations. 
Pedestrians are the most vulnerable because they travel slowly, so they are exposed to hazards the longest. They do not have the protection of being in or on a vehicle, and people with visual or mobility or other impairments are often pedestrians. People biking are the second most vulnerable road users as they don't have the added protection of being inside a car, and people biking travel more slowly than cars. So this picture is showing um, a paved shoulder that is the bicycle facility on this in this case, and they have the uh, construction equipment in the bicycle facility, which is not what we want to see. The next concept is to keep bicycle and pedestrian detours and diversions short. Detours should not create more than a 30% increase in the length of the non-motorized facility or not longer than a half a mile for bicyclists or a quarter mile for pedestrians. Most bicycle trips in the U.S. are five miles or less and most pedestrian trips in the U.S. are a quarter mile or less. Pretty quickly, a detour or diversion can double or triple the pedestrian or person biking's trip length. If a pedestrian or bicyclist perceives the detour or diversion to be too long, then they are more likely to do something risky. For a pedestrian that could be crossing mid-block without a crosswalk, and for a bicyclist that could be squeezing in between construction barrels and a travel lane. Next, there is an order of preference for rerouting of bicycles and pedestrians. The per first preference is to maintain the bicycle and pedestrian facility on the same side of the road. If you can't do that, then divert to the opposite side of the road. And if you can't do that, then detour to another road. But in all cases, return to the original road and the original side of the road as soon as possible. Crossing the street increases the likelihood of a crash. So the ideal situation is to keep pedestrians or people biking on the same side of the road. This also helps to keep the detour or diversion as short as possible. When this is not possible though, then divert to the opposite side of this road. Keeping the pedestrians and people biking on the same road avoids them going out of their way and keeps them on a road where they are comfortable with the traffic and neighborhood. When that doesn't work, then detour the road. Next. Use portable changeable message signs to notify drivers, pedestrians, and people biking of additional crossings, more pedestrians or people biking on the road, and any facility closings. So some pedestrians or people biking will avoid a route or skip a trip if it involves crossing the road, especially busy roads. So we prefer to give them advanced warning of additional crossings earlier on the route and in advance of the construction date. It is important drivers be aware of the additional bicycle or pedestrian crossings so they can be on the lookout for more people on the road, slow down, and avoid hitting them. Similarly, if pedestrians or people biking have been detoured onto a road, then we want to let drivers know to expect more pedestrians or people biking because of a detour, so they will drive carefully and be respectful. We actually had an incident where a trail was closed and people were detoured onto a parallel road. The drivers didn't know about the trail closing, the trail closing and heckled and even spat at some people biking. This behavior is never acceptable, but hopefully would be lessened with extra messaging, letting everyone know what to expect. If there will be a facility closing, then we want to give everyone as much advance notice along the route and in advance of the construction date as possible. OK, next I'm going to go over some basic uh, expectations that we have when it comes to bicycle and pedestrian temporary traffic control. The first is a short term work activity is going to be 60 minutes or less, and then a long term work activity is anything longer than 60 minutes. If the bicycle facility is a paved shoulder, then it is kept free of stored equipment, vehicles, and other obstructions. That's like that picture we showed earlier with the construction drums that were in the paved shoulder. And then sidewalk closures use pedestrian LCDs across the full width of the closed sidewalk. And a sidewalk closed sign will be attached to the LCD or out of the pedestrian way. Next, a temporary pedestrian walkway is provided if the pedestrian way is closed for more than 60 minutes. It must be firm, stable, slip resistant, have no obstructions or hazards, and a minimum of five feet wide. Walkway delineation. LCDs are interlocked, joints are free of sharp edges, and have a maximum offset of half an inch on any plane. 
LCDs are used where a drop off greater than 10 inches is within two feet of the pedestrian way or where the active work zone is within two feet of the pedestrian way. LCDs are used along both sides of a temporary pedestrian way. Crosswalks. Crosswalks within a work zone must be installed at all signalized intersections, have a functioning pedestrian signal, and align with the adjusted pedestrian path. Remove existing crosswalk markings that conflict with the adjusted pedestrian path. Detectable warnings. They must be installed on both new and temporary curb ramps before opening to pedestrian traffic. Place across the full width of the ramp or landing at a depth of two to five feet. Place in accordance with indexes 102-660 and 522-002. Okay, that concludes our basic concepts, the reasons for them, and our expectations. I hope this has been helpful, and thank you for helping to keep our bicyclists and pedestrians safe, including in work zones.